So here we are in the Scottish National Poetry Library with our National Poetry Day broadcast. How many poetries can you get into the introduction? Well, perhaps that's only just the start, but welcome, John Hegley. It's a delight to have you here. Um, it's been a weird year thus far, hasn't it? How have, you, how have you been getting on? I think it's always good to check in. I've been drawing. Um, I've been writing. I've been making biscuits. Oh, nice. Um, that's Shrewsbury biscuits and the nice thing about Shrewsbury biscuits is you put uh, five spice in oh, wow. and, and it's from the National Trust biscuit, not biscuit making book, it's a book of all sorts um, and, and here these, these, these biscuits were made by my partner Mel and I thought they're, they're would you like one? Thank you very much. I'll not eat it on camera because it looks very crumbly and delicious and I'll, I'll spill crumbs over the microphone and myself, but... That's the orange chocolate, that one. That looks delicious. And then, then there's dark. My, my daughter, Isabella, she prefers the orange chocolate. In fact, I brought three biscuits over, two of them with a dark chocolate, and she was really disappointed that there was only one orange in the... Oh, nice. And, and I've cropped the top of it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, because I guess a lot of people think, oh, well, especially people I've spoken to, they think, oh, lockdown, new writers are, are made for that. You've been in training for these sort of things all your life. But um, you're a very audience-based poet. You, I think you re react to the audience quite a lot. You try out content with them. How has lockdown been for you in terms of, of, of not gigging in the, in the physical sense? Um, I, I did a little performance out in a kind of uh, private square with the flats so people were on their balconies and there were some socially distanced folk around and it was really nice to do that and I do miss it. Um, I probably have needed some time to write some new material and I've had that and to draw some new material. I do miss it. Um, I suppose I value it. It's made me value it more and I look forward to it uh, another opportunity and an opportunity like this is a kind of in-between because you're here. Yeah. Lee is here. Asif is downstairs, and uh, Jill in the library here, in the poetry library. So, that, so just enga engagement, yeah, engagement, very important. Yeah, yeah, it's a big thing, especially in, in the city, I guess, is, has a personal resonance for you as well, because you've been coming to the Edinburgh Festival for many years in various different guises. I just wanted to cover a bit of your experience of that, especially considering festival-wise Edinburgh was, was silenced this year yeah. for the first yeah. time ever. Yeah. Um, so I would have picked up, had I been coming in in the normal fashion, I would have come in and I would have picked up Northwards Now, yeah. Northwards Now, um, which is a brilliant magazine, and I just saw it downstairs. And people who come in to collect their uh, books when they've done the click and collect can get a copy of this and there's a big story about potatoes in here which I'm looking forward to reading so that's available just at the desk north so I would have, so I come here yeah um, there's, there's I got the botanics you I always go to the M M gallery of modern art nice and just reacquaint myself with those paintings absolutely which is a, it's a really lovely thing each year to come back and you've changed they haven't changed but yeah. your perception of them has changed We've done a few shows for them recently. We did one in reaction to the Warhol and Palozzi exhibition. And of course, they've got the Palozzi's old studio from London, but brought back to Edinburgh in the Gallery of Modern Art. And you can sort of peep into his life and where it used to be. Um, so the one I was going to do here, because you mentioned, we've mentioned art. Is it called the Gallery of Modern Art or Museum of Modern Art? Gallery. It's National Gallery. Gallery. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, and the landscaping outside is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. um, so there's a, the song that you chose, you, you suggested I do, was addressed to aliens. Have you got the page number there, Michael? Uh, address. I don't, but I can find it. An alien address. An yeah. alien address, which came when Mel, my partner Mel Brimfield, was poet in residence, uh, artist in residence at Collective Gallery, which is now up on the uh, up on Colton Hill. Yeah. And um, but it was then in Coburn Street, and Mel was artist in residence. Nice. Yes. And page. I, oh. And what page is it? Twenty-eight. And she asked various people to speak to aliens, nice. address aliens, and many many folk made addresses to aliens, and I made an address to aliens. Um, 
Is it the star? Is it? Is it the stars you aim for? How much in? So I mean, it's one of the things is you sort because of, I have to see. I sing really quietly at home because I don't want to annoy the neighbours and I don't get much <laughs> to do to do it to do it at my normal you know pushing out level. Is it the stars you aim for? How much is there in your world that you haven't got a name for? Do you ever get appalled when your brand new central heating has been shoddily installed? by a bunch of cowboys. Are you green? Are you translucent? Do you have any pets? Do you have mental illness or menthol cigarettes? Do you ever feel you don't fit in with all the rest? Do you feel like an outsider? Like a money spider in a nest of penniless termites? Do you ever say, to be honest, do you ever say for my sins or our truthfulness and repentance where another world begins? Do your bins get emptied on a Tuesday? Do you have three-legged races you can compete in on your own? Do you have stripy deck chairs that get windblown when they're vacant? Is there anybody out there? Have you got ears for this? Have you got liver tablets or the equivalent of Bristol? Do you wear a pair of glasses for maybe you have eyes? Do you start off as a baby and then increase in size and but lose your sense of wonderment in the process? Do you ever get on a crowded train and have to put your luggage in the vestibule and do you ever sit in the seat nearest the door so you can keep an eye on it and then more people get on and you have to stand up and say, excuse me, excuse me, but could you move out of the way please, I need to see my luggage. Thank you very much. And that was your choice, Michael chose that one. That was my choice. One, because I like the poem, and two, contextually, also because there is uh, rumours and discussion of perhaps alien life being spotted in the cloudy ether above Venus at this point in time. So I figured if we were about to perhaps be readying ourselves for addressing the aliens, all of this content was going to come in handy. And that would be, you know, just one more tick in the box for the weird happenings of 2020. Yeah. And this strange and befuddling year. Um, what we, you mentioned in Northers now that there's a poem referencing potatoes um, and this is something which is a recurring theme of yours yep. and is definitely a trope. The potato has came across in all sorts of different incarnations in your work through over the years and I think there's a few of them. There's uh, dogs come back, the deck chair is a prevalent character but the potato is the, is the paragon and one, the foremost and I just wanted to ask why potatoes? Um, I suppose it's my favourite vegetable. Uh, it's a versatile vegetable, many forms. Um, it's the ordinary, but you know how ordinary is the ordinary? That's the thing. It's the ordinary, and it's, a concentra it's the sort of hum it's the hu it's a humble vegetable in some ways. It's um, something to concentrate on, therefore. I mean, the person in here has written, I mean, I'm, as I say, I'm really looking forward to it. There's so many pages in North Words now, it's very difficult to find the potato story, but it's in there. But it's, and they also, the potato has the most beautiful flower, and people don't tend to know about the flower of the potato. Mm. There you go. Not just the potato. I think I'd heard you say, even describe yourself as a potato before, as a sort of metaphor <laughs> for our wider quirks and quiddities. I am, yeah. Um, uh, I'm not a normal person, whatever that may be. There is something very, very vegetable about me. This human skin I'm skulking in is only there for show. I'm a potato. When I told my father it was something of a blow, he called me a grubby so-and-so. He kicked up quite a racket and he grabbed me by the jacket. I said, Daddy, will you pack it in? Won't you help me grow? Won't you be my father, not my foe? Will you love me for my blemishes and look me in the eye before one of us is underground and the other says goodbye? And he said, no. There we go. That one wasn't even scripted. No, no. Um, non merci. See, I mean, you've memorised that. Sorry, sorry, Michael. Let's talk yes, about French. Was, yeah, my Let's. father was half French, the bottom half. It's one of the little jokes that we sometimes have in the, when there's the audience there, but we're having it today. First one and the best one. Um, 
Yeah, so now that you've mentioned the French language, uh, what I was really interested in as well is you have a, a sort of rich history of teaching poetry as well to, to young adults, to kids, to adults as well. Um, but one thing you don't shy away from, I guess, in multicultural schools especially is embracing the language. If there's lots of languages spoken uh, in the class, you, yeah. you tend to bring that in in a, in a rich variety. And I guess that reflects back into you growing up a lot with the French language around yeah. you. I mean, the thing was, we didn't really have the French language. And this is one of the things I say. I say to the youngsters that I have, I have French as a bit of me. And I'm really glad of that. And some of you have other bits of you. Tell, tell me about those bits of you. And it does make it easier that you say, I have this bit. And we didn't say it. We didn't celebrate it. And I wish we did. Mm. Uh, and we do. We get. It's fantastic to have to have the other languages and to have the writing on the board. And people, when people come and write hello, and then just starting off at the right hand side is a beautiful moment. And then writing that way. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel? I mean, I know I've seen you do a few things online and in podcasts from you over the lockdown period. Um, there was one for Bradford Literature Festival and the Joe Brand podcast, which I'd really recommend with you and Holly McNish and her sort of. Joe Brand's Dream Festival, of which you were in fact headlining. Um, how is that for you in terms of, there's not a physical audience there, but you are reaching people internationally. How does that play into the, the psyche of, of your writing and performing and, and your experience with that? Um, well, part of that has been nice to show drawings, actually. I've been showing drawings um, to folk. So this image, Michael, is one that I've drawn this it person here and I'm asking folk, I'm asking, for, I've only asked three, I've asked my friend Anne who lives down Leith Walk and my partner Mel and my daughter Isabella to see which whether they prefer the top horse or the bottom horse. So Michael, that's the top horse and that's the bottom horse. Top horse, bottom horse. I'm going to go for bottom horse. Okay, so we'll put your name down there. I like this sort of... We're going for Michael's. You're, so we got, we got three bottom horses. Well, I'm in the majority, maybe because it clicks on, but also there's, at first the eyes look quite forlorn on the second horse and you think maybe it needs cheering up compared to the, the first one, but then there's a glimmer in the eyes as well, so it's, it's a, a forlorn glance that could turn into something quite chipper. So you used to feel this is a forlorn but glimmer of hope. Yeah, which is pertinent for these times. <laughs> But yeah, I guess there's that international passport of online events as well. There's the accessibility of them. There's the fact that people can watch from, you know, Brazil or Cambodia or Colombia, and they've got access to these events that physically they wouldn't be able to reach. Um, a, a wayward aberration, since I mentioned Colombia. I read you've once done a gig in a women's Colombian prison. Yes. How did uh, that come about? Uh, it came about because the festival in Medellin um, uh, puts poets into all sorts of places and the mental, um, uh, the hospital for uh, those with mental issues, um, they had the ordinary villagers, ordinary, uh, the folk with uh, the extraordinary villagers and um, everybody was together and out listening to the poets, the, 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 the patients. Uh, the staff and the people of Medellin were there listening to the poets. It's just a fantastic thing. It was just a sort of leveller. Um, um, beautiful. And, and the, then we went into the women's prison as well. Um, but the people of the town weren't allowed in there. Yeah, sounds brilliant. Um, so I'm just going to jump back to something you said earlier about not really growing up with the French language around you. Yeah. It's almost something you've addressed through your poetry. You bring in a lot of French language references mm -hmm. and could seem to, from my perspective, speak French quite, quite coherently and pretty well. You seem to have quite a, a grasp of the language. Um, Thank you very much. That's and really also that you, you almost did a, a pilgrimage into your, your, your father's French heritage. And something that really sort of captivated me was the story behind the sound of paint drying in the diary entries oh, afterwards yeah. to do with this picture that you then re, sort of revisited and recreated to yeah. an extent. Okay, well you put this, Michael, you chose this one, okay, and we haven't done many bits, so I'm going to have a go at reading some of this out. I would love that. Um, so, I'm not going to, I, I've, I did make mark out in my hotel room, from which I could see a collective gallery on, in its new home on the hill. Um, I marked out 
some bits. And it was interesting to do this. It's been interesting you making your suggestions yeah. um, and making me go back to these. Uh, because to some, to some extent you sort of tend to, I did that, not that you won't do it again, but this, it's, it's been very, no so this is a, another thing of this time, you know, you've asked me to do this and it's brought a vitality. Yeah. So yeah, I'm grateful and I'm grateful to the Scottish Poetry Library for making this happen as well. Oh, the Scot! Okay, I won't try doing any, uh, any accents because it can turn nasty. Turn a bit nasty. The Doncaster Barnsley divide. No, no you see, Doncaster, I'm not, I've got no problems. I was in Bradford, right? I was in Bradford four year, right? One year by myself, and that time, you know, so I went Bradford Fork. And I can have a go at that, but I'm not going to have a go at uh, Dunfer me Dunfermline. I'm not going to try. Me Donny. Although I did try. I said, because I, I went Bradford, I said I, I did my Bradford accent and I did it to an audience in Leeds. And I said, what do you think? And he said, it's more Barnsley. Yeah. I agree. Um, so, page number? 80. 18. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. Okay. The right young age of. Right, so we had Michael. Could you please sit in this chair where you're yeah. going to be spoken to? Because we had a thought we'd have a Michael sitting in the audience. On my wall, there is a small picture of a street scene in France painted long before I was born by an amateur watercolourist. The focus is a, th a five story, not three story, I was going to say three, five story, vine clad building with a bar at the bottom. The name is visible on the sign, Le, Le Bar de la Tre, the bar with a the trellis. There are a couple of barrels and a quintet of people. Facing the bar is a brown hatted man. There is blue sky, there are green railings. In the bottom right hand corner is the artist's signature. R. Hegley, Vietnice, 1931. My father painted canvases, his mum played mandolin, the artiness was in the blood and sometimes on the skin. We find my father sat in Nice when he was 26. He's poking at some canvas with his range of hairy sticks. First he takes his pencil and he outlines what he sees, proportion and perspective by degrees. Then turning to his brushes, to the narrow and the stout, he puts them in the pigment and he wriggles them about and it's highly naturalistic. It is not impressionistic, it is not expressionistic, neither futurist nor fauve. In places it is orange, in others it is mauve. 4th of May 2001. On the plane to Nice from Luton, my intention is to paint the scene my father painted or whatever scene is in its place. If the whole street has been turned into an office, then I will paint the wall. I have a sore throat. <clears throat> I have a supply of strepsils. Normally I buy the red ones, Strepsils originals, but for my French visit I have gone for yellow Strepsils. I believe life favours the one who takes risks. I have no painting equipment, I will purchase it in France. Why do I embark upon this journey? To take up my father's tools? to know the fixing of line and the mixing of colour as he knew it, to visit the town I know he loved. I cherish the fragment of Frenchness which I have through my father's birthplace, Paris, his name, René, and his French mother, Maman. In doing this painting, I hope to claim something of this inheritance and to find out by treading in my father's footsteps something about my own feet. 5th of May, Nice. My paints I purchased from a shop patronised by Matisse himself and possibly by my father, my own old master. I joke with the vendor about the expense of his equipment, his pencils in particular, adding that at least the water will be free. He is only very mildly amused. Seeking out the site of my father's creation, I find the same street and the same bar are still in place. The bar has a new name, but there is the very vine which clawed its way up his watercolour 70 years previous. And there is the same iron railing whose intricacies he wrought, and still it is painted green. 
6th of May. I set up with my equipment outside what was once Le Bar de la Trey. It is a sunny morning. My throat is more sore still. Still? I have had my coffee and curved croissant. Croissant? It is 10 o'clock. I set my pad upon my knee. I open my clean array of oblong colours. When asked, when asked for a pencil in the shop, the patron recommended 5H, very hard. I didn't want to contradict generations of experience and followed his direction, but I also bought a 5B pencil, a Mr Softy. I want my formative lines to be clear. I look at the leafy building before me, I survey its angles, I consider its shadows, I get the sense of it as my old dad would have done. I begin. My father's painting is very traditional and also very competent. What is of particular note is the working of the detail, as though it's been done on a massive scale and then reduced accordingly, as though the tiny is home. As I make my piece, I realise my shortcomings as a brushmaster. I get despondent early on, but stay with it. And then, working on the sky, as I pop a new yellow strepsil into my mouth to ease my aching, I know what I must do. Out comes the strepsil, and onto my newly painted blueness it goes. Mixed media watercolour and throat sweet. And the sun is in the sky and I, the sun, understand my place in things. Not the fine brush worker, the steady builder. That was my dad. I go on with renewed incentive. Don't just know your limitations. Love them. My father was a painter, and I am an idiot. I just thought that was a really sort of beautiful, melancholic, but at the same time sort of hope-inspired story, and it was indicative of what you can do so deftly is take a very serious matter and sometimes wrap it in a humour coating, but it makes it no less serious and no less profound or no less poignant just to bring a smile to people's faces at the same time and I think in your sort of self-critical nature with you doing the painting at the end and not living up to the standards of the father the I guess the the quite sweet sentiment to that is what you've done is your own version of that and you've pieced it together as a piece of writing and poetry that's almost memoir-esque. I think uh, yeah I mean one tries when you're working with people who do drawings. I mean, when you work with youngsters and they do a drawing, they, they'll tell you their drawings are terrible. Yeah. Um, but, but they're wonderful, whatever, you know, whatever they are, it's theirs. It's, uh, and my painting isn't that good. But, you know, there was a strepsil and the strepsil has actually dripped down. Yeah. And then there was this fantastic writing that came out the other end of it. Um, and I think that's, it was really interesting to see the resonance of your father throughout all the different poems, sometimes in humorous ways, sometimes in quite serious sentiments of regret and uh, issues he had with that uh, sort of striking you when you were younger and all this stuff, really quite deep, quite personal family stuff came out of it. Um, but you got the love between you and your father and the, and the, and the interest and intrigue you had into his history and how you couldn't have explored more of that and you did get to explore more through these writings which was just a bit of a, a joy to witness really. It was a joy to do. I mean it was, ama it was amazing to go. When we, when we um, walked, Nigel who made the radio programme, I don't know if it's still available, but we made a radio programme about this and Nigel, my daughter, Isabella's godfather, um, walked me towards it. He was the producer of it. And he walked me towards, and I'd not seen, I'd not been to Nice. This is the first 19, uh, what, uh, whatever, 2001, I think it was, we went. And he said, open your eyes. And I opened my eyes and it was the, my dad's painting, you know, and it was virtually the same. It was, it was an amazing moment. And uh, Nigel doing that was incredible. Um, yeah.
just the idea of that vine still being there and soaked there. up, all those sunlight and stories. Yeah. So that's obviously the relationship with your father that comes through. The brother-in-law, however, does not come out <laughs> quite, quite so unabashed. <laughs> no. Um, no. My brother-in-law, the kind of chap who likes to stop and ask hitchhikers where they're going and then tell them he'll get there first. But of course, hitchhikers, you don't get so many hitchhikers now, and especially at this time. Um, the brother-in-law is a melting pot for all sorts of n negative uh, or questionable and sometimes negative aspects of humanity, some of which are my own, or are my own, some of which are other people's. Chuck them into the brother-in-law melting pot, you know. It's, so that's what that is. Everyone needs a villain. Especially if unexpected guests stop by and there's clean sheets upstairs. Oh, yeah. Well, that was me. So that's the, the, the Michael is referring to an incident that I attribute to my brother-in-law in which I say that, uh, I, that it's, we didn't know that somebody was coming and, uh, well, it's me, it was me. I resented the fact that they d didn't tell us they were coming and they arrived and uh, it thought, you know, can we stay? And I thought, no, oh, you know, they just turn up like that. And so I went upstairs and I changed the sheets and put the dirty ones back on. It's, it, went, it was me and I say my brother-in-law did it, yeah. So that's that sorted out. <laughs> we found out what's, what's gone on there. Uh, so I'm going to bounce quickly back to, you've been busking outside Hull, Hull and not long after that, you actually end up fronting a, a poetical band and, and doing a couple of John Peel sessions. Yeah. There's not too many poets that I think have got that in the kit bag. Popticians, Keith, Sue and Russ, um, beautiful, to, they, they were busking, uh, I was busking more poems, they were busking more music, we combined and um, Keith Moore thought of the name Popticians because we were singing a lot of Glasses songs and um, so Glasses, Glasses, um, yeah and we, yeah there's a really nice one called Contact Lenses Out that Keith wrote the music for I don't like contact lenses and I'd like to tell you why. First of all, to put one in, you gotta poke yourself in the eye and then they make you cry, especially when they get around the back of your eyeball. Yeah. It sounds painful. Yeah. You've, you've, honed, yeah. you've honed that misery. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I mean, lots of people will refer to you as the bespectacle poet. You've very much owned the spectacles. They've became a, a writing trope and, and indeed one of your one of your characteristics, I'd go as far to say. There's a lot of spectacle endorsing content. Well, it's, yeah, I'm, it's, I, I like my specs. I like my glasses. Um, bit, you know, clean. Um, and uh, people, you know, people did shout out about the glasses, you know, or, or specky and all that sort of stuff. So it's um, embrace that. Take ownership embrace, of it. Mm -hmm. Take ownership of it. Yeah embrace, yeah. yeah, embrace that, deal with that, talk about that. Let's, com let's confront it, everybody. Let's look at it. I'm going to get my glasses on out of homage <laughs> at this point in time. I thought I would, you know, mix it up aesthetically and not wear mine, but there comes a moment wow. in every pod. Hold on, everybody. In every broadcast. Although well, uh, these are going to be, have to clean, be cleansed afterwards. <laughs> this is not a normal glasses case in my mind, you know. What is... What, Hey? And the first ever contemporary Scottish Park National Poet was indeed Edwin Morgan, who I feel like you are a fan of. But Edwin Morgan, marvellous. Um, I, I did interview him in 1989 for um, a Border TV programme, and he was the first person I ever interviewed. And I said, would you be gentle with me? And he was, he was beautiful. Um, and I'd seen um, message, message Clear, yeah. It's a beautiful poem where it's, it's, it's a form, it's the form on the page um, sort of poem. And then there's Starlings in George, is it called Starlings in George Square? Yeah. Which is so uh, descriptive, so he, 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 he's so experimental, so uses poetry so much. Yeah. And, um, we, and of course, this would have been his 100th birthday this year, his centenary year. So there was all sorts of celebrations going on. Lots of them have moved online, but hopefully the physical element of them will come back next year. And it sounds almost more fitting of Edwin Morgan to have celebrations for his 101st birthday than for his 100th. Um, but you've chosen a, a, poet of, a poem of Edwin's that we might do together. Yeah. 
Um, this is what, when we, uh, sometimes in our, poet, well, in poetry, in our poetry group, we've done this, and there's been seven or eight of us have done this. Um, I, I, there's also, I had, look, I've got these other ones here. All right, there's yeah. one here. I just want to do one poem that Absolutely. I did write with me and my partner. It's, very, it's only a limerick, but Mel and I wrote this. There once was a woman of Peebles who was known for her throne stick retrievals. She thought she was a dog, which she actually was. I got a bit confused at the beginning. <laughs> Now, this is called Opening the Cage, and uh, it's, m perhaps, Michael, you would introduce it for us. So, it's 14 variations on 14 different words, which initially came from a statement made by John Cage, which was... I have nothing to say, and I am saying it, and that is poetry. I have to say poetry, and is that nothing? And I am saying it. I am. And I have poetry to say. And is that nothing saying it? I am nothing. And I have poetry to say. And that is saying it. I that am saying poetry have nothing. And it is I. And to say. And I say that I am. To have poetry. And saying it is nothing. I am poetry and nothing. And saying it is to say that I have. To have nothing is poetry, and I am saying that, and I say it. Poetry is saying I have nothing, and I am to say that, and it. Saying nothing, I am poetry, and I have to say that, and it is. It is, and I am. And I have poetry saying say that to nothing. It is saying poetry to nothing, and I say I have, and I am that. Poetry is saying I have it, and I am nothing, and to say that. And that nothing is poetry, and I am saying, and I have to say it. Saying poetry is nothing, and to that I say I am and have it. It gets, you get jumbled in those word associations. Yeah. I thought, have I just read one of your lines <laughs> towards the tail end of it? And then I thought, you've just got to keep going. Perhaps no one will notice. But I think Poetry can be that. fun. Poetry can be fun. <laughs> there was a line of yours as well, especially that word play. I made a little note of it, but let me see. It was to do with... Ah, and Mr. Cooper continued. It was something of yours that reminded me of that, which was the, uh, the line... He was the life and party of my soul, which showed you taking one of these very common phrases, mixing up the words and just having a bit of fun with it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Edwin Morgan is, um, is an exemplar and one you, you learn from him. Um, I've learned from him, I hope. Um, and W.S. Graham also. Um, and John Keats... His letters are phenomenal. So and people know more about his poems than his letters. So I knew you were a bit of a Keats fan from the, from the fact that you write poems about Keats and you have professed yourself to be a Keats fan. Not only that, you've been writer in residence in Keats House, have you not? Yeah, that was a... Uh, I was mentally ill at the time, actually, when I was given that opportunity. Oh. And it was just a, um, a wonderful... A, a, a wonderful work, a wonderful something to dive into, to dive into the world of John Keats and um, healing. And he, he studied to be a doctor and he did some healing. Yeah. He had a really, I mean, in sort of preparation for this, I was listening to Keats Walk North yesterday on BBC Sounds, but he had a really hard time. He goes on this mammoth journey to try and find poetic expression and experience for himself. He goes to visit Wordsworth, who's out. Um, and goes for his sort of sanction on a lot of his words and Wordsworth is a way I think sort of politically canvassing for, for what he considers the other side and then he goes to try and find Burns who's been a great inspiration to him and it's unsure whether he actually managed to locate the grave and then he finds the tomb too ostentatious and I think he goes to like the Burns cottage and it's turned into a bar or some element of it and he's, and he's sort of really 
crestfallen that it's not a homage to birds, but he has a whiskey nonetheless. He goes to Mull and it's, what I think he describes it as missiling rain and he's just having this really hard time. He don't like rain. No. <laughs> and, uh, and it just seems like sort of tragedy after tragedy from the Keats perspective, but he comes back after this sort of botched journey and writes what will be in a short period of time all which are considered the, the great poems of his oeuvre. Yeah, he also he left a, he left a note. Uh, he said he said I, I left a note for Wordsworth when he wasn't in, and I don't think it's ever been found. Oh. Uh, look, so this poem about Rabbi Burns, I'd like you. So that's what I'm going to ask you to say. So just get that in your mind. Yeah. So that's your line. Got it. After I say that line, okay? Yeah. Are you all right with that? Yeah. Okay. A revenue rabbi called Burns comes around to our house and discerns what to put in his purse and he gives you a verse and he says many happy returns. Tax returns you can. There we go. I was, do you know, I was waiting for the applause there, John. <laughs> it didn't come. <laughs> Another poem I'd just love to hear you read um, just because it touches on the nature of what poetry is. Um, and it being a National Poetry Day broadcast, is one called Digging For It. Sometimes a poem is less of an invention and more of a find. Its birth, a kind of archaeology, a job of unearthing and piecing together. And sometimes, the piece won't fit because it's part of something else. And sometimes it is just a bit of old rubbish. There we go. A mantra for poetry writing going forward. Well, well, it's not going to do any harm, is it, to sing a song? It's not going to do any harm to sing a song. I think it will definitely be used in some variety. You want me to be audience member? Oh, yeah. Me? Do you want to be... Uh, when I give you the nod, sing, sing John Keats. There's a few uh, uh, in the version here. Uh -huh. There's some John Keatses for the audience to sing. And you just you just sing John Keats. John Keats. That's it. There we go. This is this is a song about John Keats. I've been going through the poetry and letters of a man who didn't have sufficient time. A man who walked on Hampstead Heath in autumn with his vessel full of Mr. William Shakespeare and the fruitfulness of rhyme. John Keats. With your days laid out so eager, it's no surprise how eager was your pace. John Keats. You wanted to complete a life that was held completely in the grip of poetry because poetry you held to be most naturally holy. You suggested that a poem should come out complete as certain and as surely on a, as a leaf upon a tree but preferably not as slowly I've been going through the poetry and letters of a man who later than his life was so much better known. A man whose payday came too late for him to get a ticket to get sat inside the coach instead of getting wet and windblown. Up beside the driver, a man who was no skyver, but the world it can deprive a man, no matter what his feats. Can I lend you a fiver? No. Make that a tenor, sweet John, John Keats. That concludes our National Poetry Day broadcast. Biscuits. Thank Biscuit, you very Biscuit much. Energy. Mr. John Hegley, thank you for the biscuits. Let's see how I get on with those sugars. Keep it sweet.